Well, good morning to everybody. So good to see all of you. It's Christmas time. And, uh, you know, just in the worship, uh, as Freddie was just praying in and around the whole mountains that some of us face, the scripture came to mind where the psalmist says, the hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord. And whatever the hill or mountain is to you, that you would realize that when you compare that mountain to God and his presence, that that mountain would begin to melt. And uh, even if the mountain doesn't melt, the fear that's created a bigger mountain of the mountain would begin to melt in your mind and you would begin to see that God is greater than all things, amen? Aren't you loving this time? Uh, it's as if all the stressed out Valleys, all the stressed out Johannesburgers have left town and they've now let, let us just chill and rest. Driving to church this morning, I just thought, what's changed? The climate's cool, it's calm. They're all out elsewhere. So anyway, let's enjoy this holiday atmosphere. We're in our second part of our series called uh, Christmas, a call to worship. And as we reflect over 2017, and you kind of just look at what God has done in our lives. Some of us have had a stressful 2017, others a great 2017, others where we've just seen God's goodness and mercy in so many different ways, and uh, we're just so conscious of God's grace and His love for each one of us. And yet if we're honest, maybe if we look back over some of our days, we realize the strategy that we adopted for that day maybe wasn't the best strategy. And we kind of think, is there a better way to live every day? Pastor Jack Hayford, he's now in his 80s, a wonderful man of God, a wonderful pastor. He's influenced, I'd say, millions of lives, thousands of pastors. I've had the privilege of being mentored by him indirectly, as well as sometimes directly through his pastor's seminars, his resources, books, and tapes, and now these days, MP3s, and, and uh, he started a church called Church on the Way. And the reason why he called it Church on the Way was for three reasons. One was that it was actually located on a road called Sherman Way, and this is in Finais, uh, California, Los Angeles. And also, he wanted the congregation to know this, that they were church on the way, that they moved beyond just the four walls of the church, that they would gather together, but they would go into wherever God had placed them in their professions, in their neighborhoods, in their homes, and that there would be a people on the way with Jesus with them. And also, that it came from a scripture from Hebrews chapter 10, where it talks about Jesus offers a new and living way. The New Living Translation says a new and life-giving way. It's a word that I love, a life-giving. And I believe that for all of us, Jesus wants to offer us a new and living, life-giving way to handle every day. And I believe it's God's desire for all of us. I know that we're in the December time. A lot of you are still working, and uh, yet you just sense uh, this, this chilled vibe in one sense but that you and I would embrace the fact that God wants us to live in His presence every day and not just on Sundays. I love this corporate anointing, God's manifested presence when we come together like this and we're reminded of what Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in His name, there He is in the midst of us. And so there's something special when we're together like this or in groups. On the other hand, God also wants us to embrace every day knowing that there is a life-giving way and that we can honestly walk in His presence. Can you imagine what your day would look like if you had this deep awareness, regardless of what was awaiting you, that you had this deep awareness that God was with you, that He loved you, that He was walking with you, that He was leading you? I believe what would happen in those situations, we would prevent our lives from becoming so preoccupied with our daily demands and pressures and concerns, and there are so many things that can concern us. 
And so we are reminded of what Jesus said, to be careful of the deceitfulness of riches and the worries, the cares of this life, and how they so often begin to choke the work of God in us, and that there is a better life-giving way for us to handle the daily demands, that we are not preoccupied with them, but we're more focused in on His presence as He's leading us and guiding us, and that we have this mindfulness, this deep awareness that He is with us, that you're not alone, and that there's someone who deeply loves you and is wanting to know that He is there with you and guiding you. And I believe when we enter into His presence and honestly embrace the call of Christmas, which is the call to worship, that we create space for God wherever we are, wherever we are. I don't often go out on a Saturday night, but Lee and I had been invited to uh, a concert with Brian Adams. It's one of the reasons why I got my hair so short, so I could look a little like him. <laughs> and he's playing. But there I'm in the Coca-Cola Dome, place is pumping, and yet in that moment, I just tune in, and I'm just aware that, God, you know, you are here. You are here. I'm looking at everybody, they're enjoying themselves, I'm enjoying myself, and yet I'm aware that I've got a big day ahead of me, and I take Sundays very seriously, so I never want to waste your time, and I know it's a beautiful time for us to meet with God together as one church. But just there, even in a concert, conscious of God's presence, and I believe that when we uh, enter into God's presence, create space for Him through worship, that God begins to work in us and begins to transform us in ways that we didn't count on. And also begins to walk at work in wonderful ways and we begin to live confidently in the present moment, enjoying His wisdom, His love, His grace, His guidance. And so the presence of God satisfies our deepest longings. Just by the way, if Ignite, or well, the way are uh, raising the volume, it's their last day before they go into holiday, so please be gracious on our beautiful teenagers. We want them to have super fun. Don't tell them I told them that because they're going to raise the volume. God's presence is enough, and that in His presence, we have access to everything that we need, and that it's through Jesus that He makes it possible that we have a way into His presence every single day through Jesus, but there's certain things that we can do to create the conditions where we encounter His manifest presence, where He's omnipresent as we looked last week, but now that we are more aware of His presence, as if the manifested presence, it's that God makes His presence fully known to us as we create the conditions to be more mindful and more aware of Him as we begin to worship Him, and it's in through worship that we are aware that God is there and that releases God's presence into our circumstances. And so today's message, I've called it entryway. Go in and go out with Him. Entryway, go in and go out with Him. We know the famous Solomon, King Solomon, the wisest and wealthiest man who ever lived. And we go back before he, he's just become king, and God, in a dream, speaks to Moses, uh, Solomon and says, what do you want? And we know what his answer is. He says, I want wisdom. God, please give me wisdom. And we realize that's when we embrace wisdom, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the foundation tool. As he does that, it's what creates more wisdom in his life, wealth, and a whole combination of things. But there is something about Solomon, there's a reason why he's asking for wisdom. He's a young man. And we pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. It says, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon said, you have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You've continued this great kindness for him, and you've given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord my God, you've made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Now, this phrase, I don't know how to go out or come in. I mean, here is an intelligent young guy. Uh, did he have a problem with door handles that he didn't know how to go out or come in? 
Did he not know how to enter his castle or exit his castle? But it's interesting as we begin to just look at this phrase of uh, how to go out and come in, you, we see how the Bible always defines itself. And that coming in and going out are used quite a few times through Scripture. In fact, uh, the, 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 the Bible, uh, Moses, he's praying to the Lord about a new a successor. And look what he actually asks that he wants the successor to know. He wants him to do one thing in Numbers chapter 27, verse 16. He says, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation who may go out before them and go in before them, who may lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be like a shepherd which have no shepherd. Sheep which have no shepherd. So here we see going before him and leading them out. And so here he's saying, listen, Joshua, I'm wanting Joshua to become a leader, but I, I need to know that this guy can uh, come in and go out. In Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 12, Moses will say this, I am 120 years old today. I can no longer go out and come in. What's Moses referring to here? Just as a matter of interest, this is not the normal age for pastors to retire at 120 years old. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 6, Bible says this, Blessed shall you be when you come in. And some of you need to hear this. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. So when you go in and when you go out with him, that you would realize that you are blessed by God. Jesus will even refer to this same phrase in John 10, verse 9, where he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. He'll go in and out and find pasture. What does this mean? In the book of Joshua, Caleb one of the spies that went into the promised land and saw the giants, but he saw them as grasshoppers. The other uh, spies were in fear of the, 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 the giants, but not Joshua and Caleb. And here we begin to see the definition of what coming in and going out is, means. It's, he says this, as yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. And so here, this is a military term. Caleb is referring to strength for war, how he's going to handle war, and that coming in and going out are military terms. And so Moses, when he was talking about this, he was saying, listen, I don't have the strength for war anymore. I don't know how to come in and go out. And so I'm needing a successor. And then Joshua steps in. When we look at the scriptures in 1 Corinthians 10, it talks about how the examples, that the Old Testament are spiritual examples for us today. And so when we begin to see certain patterns, certain truths in the Old Testament, we can lean in by the New Testament scripture, obviously within context, and see certain examples being uh, explained to us. Now, just as if they, as they were going into war, we could ask ourselves today, are we in a war? Jesus one day says, listen, there is an enemy. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to neutralize your peace, your confidence, your joy in God. He doesn't want you to embrace the wonderful plan that God has for you. He wants to do everything he can to distract us from God's presence and his plan for our lives and why we've been put on this earth. And so there is an enemy. Even Paul the Apostle will talk about the fact that, listen, we are not wrestling against flesh and blood. So often we think it's just about people, but we're wrestling against spiritual forces of evil in this day. But understanding through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and what Jesus did, that he's given us spiritual authority that we can submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. But we've got to understand that how, how, how can we know how to go into war, knowing that there's God's plan for us, and he's given us all the resources and authority for us, and wisdom, and presence to help us accomplish his will for us each day, that he's a plan for each day. 
and for our lives and how we go to war against the enemy and know how to come in from war. And so here Solomon says, listen, my father knew how to do this and God, please give me wisdom. Give me wisdom in how to go out and come in. How to come in and go out. And there's an interesting passage of scripture that begins to unpack this whole concept in 1 Samuel chapter 18 verse 12. It says, now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in. He went out and came in before the people, and David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and, his, and the Lord was with him. I was just repeating that for effect. Therefore, when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. So here we see this, ref- this phrase is referring to war and going out in war. But the part that I want us to focus on this morning is the whole idea of coming in, of going in. Not just going out, but this whole idea of what it meant to come in. What were they coming into? They were, the whole reference is coming into God's presence. They were coming into worship. There was something about David, he knew that as he would lead his warriors, lead his army, that he wanted them to enter God's presence before they would go out of war. No matter where they were in the war, before or end or during, that there was something about the attitude that they, he wanted them to enter into God's presence, to be worshipers. No matter what kind of war it was, he wanted to lead them into the house of God, lead them to the house of God first, his presence. Now, David was a mighty man, a strong man. He was a warrior like the gladiator, Maximus and gladiator, a strong man, a strong warrior. On the other hand, so often what we don't see is that he was first a worshiper, that he was a worshiper who loved God's presence, and so he knew as a warrior how to go out and war. But he also knew as a worshiper what it is to go in, to come in to God's presence. And so he valued God's presence above everything, was able to see things from God's perspective. And so worship was the way he led the Israelites into God's presence. He knew the nation, the nation would depend on their attitude towards God and his presence. And so in David's time, he led the people to the house of God first, worship before they went out to war. And if they lost the war, they would come back into God's presence and just begin to pour out their hearts to God in moments where maybe they lost the victory and didn't hear God the way they should have, that it was a moment of just reflecting and also just repenting in God's presence. If they had won the war, they'd come into God's presence and begin to celebrate for some of us, we got to celebrate this year. Look what the Lord has done in and through you to celebrate. And that even times in the middle of a lengthy war, they would come into God's presence and be refreshed. And so in the same way, the moments where, uh, where, where you have felt maybe you've lost a victory or maybe we didn't obey the Lord like we did, that what we're going to do, instead of hiding and running away from God's presence, we come into God's presence and say, God, listen, I, I got that wrong. And Lord, I just want to get your mind on this again. Times when you have felt weary in the battle, that the moments what we're going to do is just come into God's presence and be refreshed in Him, give you the power for your day, the wisdom for your day. In moments where we have won the victory, that we come into the presence of God and we just begin to worship Him. Now there's this scripture, 1 Samuel 18, where it unpacks three benefits to God's presence or worship. The first is that worship brings God's presence in our lives. Worship brings God's presence in our lives. 1 Samuel 18 verse 12, it says, Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him. Verse 14 says, And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. What made David a great king? I believe it was because the Lord was with him. And there was something about David. He was a man after God's own heart. He loved God, loved his presence. And so he was a man that would write psalms. 
uh, and sing these psalms, these beautiful songs to the Lord, even as a shepherd boy, had this beautiful relationship with the Lord, was a worshiper of God. So there was something about David, he knew that God was with him, and one of the reasons why he was aware of God's presence, because he was a worshiper. Yes, a mighty warrior, a mighty king, a great leader, but the key to his success was the fact that he embraced and loved and encountered God's presence. And I believe every one of us want to reach our full potential, but I tell you this, I don't believe we're going to ever reach our full potential in Him if we're not going to be worshipers. And so we're going to need God's presence to help us achieve His will, His plan for us. It would be David who understood the entryway into God's presence. He was the one, as we saw last week, he said, listen, you are the one who inhabits the praises of your people. So there's something about praise that allows us to experience more of God's manifested presence wherever we are, in the office, with deadlines, that you and I, if we've got the attitude of praise and the attitude of worship in this, that we can just pause and begin to reflect on Him, come into His presence and know that, God, you're here with me, and He inhabits, He dwells among us. We sense His manifested presence. And so it's a remedy for moments when we're feeling like we're in a war, that we're battling, we're struggling, maybe you're feeling lonely, discouraged, depressed, that the remedy for those moments is praise. And that when we praise and worship, God enters our circumstances. So David was a great king because he was a worshiper. And when he would go out, he knew how to come in. And this is crucial for us each and every day that we're learning how to live in God's presence. And a key, key way is learning how to come into God's presence. What we also need to know in this is that it's not that we're going out from his presence, but that we're going with his presence. Says we have those moments where we just worship him, whether it's in the car, at home, wherever it is, that as we're worshiping him, that we're going out with his presence. If we are not prepared to come into the presence of God, then we've got nothing to go out with. We're not aware or mindful that he is there with us because we're so focused and so preoccupied with the, the pressures and the pain. But when we get into that attitude of worship, what does it do? It helps us understand that we are going in, but also going with the presence of the Lord, that you're not alone. So when you're going into a meeting, that you know this, that I'm going with the presence of the Lord, I'm not alone. I don't just have to rely on my own faculties. I don't have just to rely on just my own intellect. Yes, God wants us to use our intellect, use our talents and our gifts, but that what you've got is you've got somebody that wants to awaken even more of those gifts and give you his mind, his will. You may have all the dots or all the facts, but there's something about walking in the presence of God that he helps us see things that we may never see in the natural. And so we want to go out with his presence. So often we see it as Jesus' last words were go, go into the world. And this is the great commission that every one of us as followers of Christ need to know that God has a mission for us individually and corporately, and yes, we must go, but those weren't Jesus' last words. Important words, his last words were stay. Stay until the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Here, my disciples, my early church, listen, I've got a a, a mission for you to fulfill. There's a war out there, but listen, there's the kingdom of God. His will is going to be established on earth, and I'm wanting you to go. But before you go, I want you to stay. I want you to learn to come in. I want you to become recipients of my presence, the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit as you go into your day. And so what we're going to do is learn what it is to come in before we go out. And that we're going out with him. And there's something that we need to do every day. Before we go out to war, we come in till you're filled with the presence. And then we go out with the presence of God. We're going out with him. It's Not that we have this moment like today and we think, okay, well, Jesus stays in the building. So we had this beautiful moment today as new lifers. We get in our car and now the presence of the Lord stays here. No, the presence of the Lord is with you in the car, wherever you go. But it's us now becoming more and more aware of his presence with us, that we need him every day. Secondly, 1 Samuel 18 also helps us see that worship brings God's fear in our lives. Fear in our lives. Listen to what it says in verse 12. Now Saul was afraid of David. Why? Because the Lord was with him. So yes, Saul is afraid of David. The Bible talks about there was this evil spirit on this king called Saul. 
And this evil spirit was afraid of David. Why? Because Saul, the presence of God operating in David's life. Why was the presence of God operating in David's life? Part of God's call upon him, but big time was, main reason was because he was a worshiper. He valued God's presence above everything. And so we've got to understand that in the same way that we're in a war, yes, overcoming the enemy, God's given us weapons of warfare that we don't have to allow the, 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 the arrows of the enemy to pierce our hearts, that we can use the shield of faith and walk in his truth, walk in his presence. But we've got Jesus right there with us. I remember as a little boy, my parents moved, uh, born in Durban, and um, yeah, they moved up to Cockstead. I think I was around uh, six years old, seven years old. And so here I was, the new boy in the school, grade one. And it was a big school. It was preschool, primary school, high school, so a big school. And uh, here I was, the new kid on the block, feeling quite uh, vulnerable and insecure. And I remember there were these grade seven, standard fives, that came to me one day, and they started intimidating me, saying things that, listen, if we ever see you on the streets and it's not like Coxdale was a huge, huge town, but listen, we're going to hurt you. Why they did it, I don't know. But I remember those words, they, they instilled fear in me. And I remember for some time, I'd get up early in the morning, so scared I was going to see these bullies. And I'd get on my bicycle and quickly ride to my friend and get there early. And I remember my folks, for a while, they noticed something. And they said, Chris, what's wrong? And I remember mentioning it to my dad and saying, Dad, these, these guys, like a gang of 10 of them, this is what they said to me. I'll never forget that the next day, my dad uh, says, okay, Chris, I want you to show me where they are. And so, yeah, he parked on the so side, and there was this fence, and there they were standing on the steps, all 10 of them. And he got out the car, and had me standing next to him, and he got their attention. And just spoke to them firmly. Now, I understand maybe you could say that he should have gone through the school. Those were the old days. But he said enough to them to make them realize, listen, you touch him, there's going to be some major, major problems. <laughs> and he's six foot three, a, a big guy. And it was funny the respect I had from that day onwards. I rode around Coxstad as if this, this town belonged to me. <laughs> they knew who was backing me. And so in the same way, you've got to realize that you've got a God who is greater than all things, the name above every name, who says, listen, you my darling, you my loved one, I deeply love you, I cherish you, and my hand is upon you. And so when you walk around, you have this, uh, this, this revelation that Jesus, you're with me, I'm not alone. And the enemy knows that, and just like the evil spirit on Saul was afraid of God's presence, because why David was with, walking with God, he knew how to go in and go out with God. He wasn't trying to do it without the armor of God. He wasn't trying to do it without the presence of God. He said, he realized, I need God every day. And I'm not going to just try and depend on my own abilities, my own strength. Yes, use them for God's glory, but let it be fueled by God's spirit, by God's presence. Even when Jesus came to deliver a demon-possessed man, what did the demons say when they saw Jesus? They said, Jesus, have you come to torment us? And what some of us have got to realize is Jesus is not scared of the devil. The enemy is scared of Jesus, and he's also scared of people of God who become true worshipers and begin to walk in the power of his spirit, the power of his presence on a daily basis, no matter what we're going through. And then thirdly, worship brings God's wisdom in our lives. Do we need wisdom in these days? Listen to what it says, 1 Samuel 18, verse 14, and David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Solomon was wise because what happened is God taught him what his father knew. That as a warrior, yes, he knew how to go out and war, but he was a worshiper, and he knew how to come into God's presence. And I believe it's something that every one of us have to embrace now and in going into 2018. It's so easy to lose perspective, guys, so easy. But I tell you, there's something about when we just make that decision, that attitude that, God, I want to worship you and I want to walk in your presence daily. Wow, it's amazing that how God elevates your mindset, your mind, that when you realize God's ways, his thoughts are so much higher than my thoughts and my ways. 
I sang it last week when I went on my prayer walk, and here I had the revelation of just, God, as I'm worshiping, Lord, how big you are and great, and your ways and thoughts are so much bigger than mine. And it was like, I thought, oh, God, what a beautiful way to live. If every one of us is new lifers, me included, that if we could begin to live at this frequency, tuning into that place where, wow, God is with me wherever I'm going. I've got this deep awareness that he's with me. And so here, Solomon learned how to come in and go out in the presence of the Lord. And it says David behaved wisely. Why? Because the Lord was with him. Some challenges that we face where we need the wisdom of God. We, we don't have it all in, our own, in ourselves. And so we're going to need God every day. We need to be dependent on him. And then how do we respond to some of the tough situations? And ourselves so often we can't. And this is why we need God's wisdom to help us and understand he's there with you. He is the spirit of truth, that he is the all-wise, omniscient, all-knowing one, and that we have access to his presence, his wisdom, to help us each day. And that we don't have to do it alone, and that we can enter whole new levels if we'll embrace God's wisdom. And what's so beautiful in the scriptures, it talks about if we'll ask for God's wisdom, he'll give it to us liberally. But we've got to ask it. Now, what's interesting is we land today, Solo we know is known as the wisest, wealthiest man. There's also another lady, Queen of Sheba. She's known as one of the wisest, wealthiest queens and, 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 and prosperous monarchies in Persia. And here's what happens. She wants to, she's super bright. She hears about Solomon's fame and fortune and wisdom, and now she wants to go and test him. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test Solomon with hard questions. Having a very great retinue of camels that bore spices, gold in abundance, in fact, 4,000 kilograms of gold, that's a lot of change, and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. And so on, Solomon answered all her questions. So she's throwing all these tough questions. And there was nothing too difficult for Solomon that he could not explain to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers and their apparel, and notice this, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. Wisdom comes from the presence of God. And every one of us need wisdom these days. And so here, we know that Solomon would be the one that would say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yes, in a world that's filled with information and knowledge, and knowledge is a good thing, but what we need is we need the wisdom of God in these days. And where wisdom comes, it first and foremost comes from God. The fear of the Lord, the worship, the love of God is the beginning of wisdom. He who says there is no God is a fool, the scriptures say. And so here we got to understand, we really want to operate in the wisdom of God these days. It's about worship and understanding the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and his will. But now look what Queen Sheba sees as she, oper- as she views this home, this, this, this palace of Solomon. She sees how there's excellence and there's, uh, the, sur- the, the, sur- the service is five star. The food is amazing. The, this house that has been built, it, it just, it, 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 she's amazed by it. And I believe it also speaks of, of the body of Christ and we as the church that there needs to be excellence in what we do. There needs to be obviously authenticity and the touch of God's presence. There needs to be order in his house, in his church. Good spiritual food and excellence in, in, in what we do. But there was something about Queen Sheba that left, the spirit of her left her. She was just without any argument. She was blown away, not just by what she saw, but what, when she saw the entryway. When she saw this wise man, he was able to answer all the questions. And in those days, um, Queen Sheba, it was all about, they, they worshiped wealth and wisdom. And they were all about these riddles, and, and, and they loved riddles and proverbs. And so when she was coming to King Solomon, she wanted to test his knowledge. And sometimes in your life, you're going to be tested by some tough questions and tough situations. But here, something that moves her is when she sees the entryway. She sees a man 
with all his fame and his fortune and all his wisdom, but she sees a secret. She sees the entryway into God's presence. And the Bible says there was no more breath left in her, all arguments left. And I believe in the same way, when we live in God's presence, he's right there to give us the answers to our questions. And also that people would begin to see not an arrogance in us, but more, more a humility that they'd see what is it about you and they'd be drawn to the presence of God, how much he loves everyone around us. I wonder if Queen Sheba was changed from that day onwards as she began to see the secret to Solomon's success, his entryway. He knew how to go in and go out with the presence of God, which made him a very, very wise man. One last phrase or scripture. Ezekiel chapter 46 verse 9. We'll use this, see the same phrase being used again. But when the people of the land came before the Lord on the appointed feast days, whoever enters by way of the north gate to worship shall go out by the way of the south gate. And whoever enters by way of the south gate shall go out by way of the north gate. He shall not return by way of the gate through which he came, but shall go out through the opposite gate. What is this saying? We had to modernize this. Let's say it was a huge uh, hailstorm, and we'd rushed into through the front doors, the south gate by the, uh, the slab outside. And here it was a huge hailstorm, hailstones all over the slab. We go in, we've come to worship, but what I said to you guys, I said, listen, when we exit, please don't go through the south doors. Let's go through the east and west doors because I don't want anyone to slip. And so why would God be saying, listen, when you enter the north gate, when you come to worship, when you come into God's presence through the north gate, exit through the south gate. I believe God wants us to know this. That when we worship, every time we come into God's presence, whether you're at home, at church, in a small group, wherever you are, whenever you come into God's presence, you'll leave differently from the way you came in. Some of us need to hear this. Whenever you worship, no matter where you are, if you'll just have the attitude of a worshiper, God, I just want to love you and just worship you, that you'll leave differently from the way you came in. And so if you come in sad, when you're into God's presence, you'll leave glad. When you come in hurting and we begin to really come into God's presence, I believe we'll leave healed. When you come in tired and weary and dry and exhausted, that you'll be leaving refreshed. If you come to worship whenever or wherever you are, you'll go out differently the way that you came in. Solomon knew something about his dad. His dad knew how to go in and go out with the presence of God. Here, he builds this amazing palace, amazing temple, and he has this entryway into God's presence. Speaking of worship, speaking of how worship releases God's presence, his wisdom, and even God's fear in our lives against the enemies, our spiritual enemies. And so worship is that entryway into God's presence. And so it's my prayer that for every one of us, no matter where we're going this holiday, if we're chilling out here, going to the coast, going overseas, wherever you're going. It's time to, yes, rest and be refreshed, but that we don't have to go on a holiday to find that refreshing, and rest is important, but that we'd also find that true refreshing, that rest that comes just by being in His presence, taking moments in our day just to know, God, you're with me, and Lord, I'm just understanding why I'm here. Lord, I've been created to worship you, and Lord, I need your presence. I need your wisdom, I need your guidance, I need your peace, I need your perspective, I need your provision. So many different things that we have access to his glorious, glorious presence. I wanna ask us if we could just stand. What we're gonna do is we're gonna worship as the worship team come forward. But if we can just bow our heads. That some of you feel like you're in the middle of the battle. God wants to visit you this morning. He wants to refresh you. That there is a new and life-giving, a better way to handle our day. And that's through the atmosphere, the attitude of casting your attention upon your God, our God, our Father, our Creator, 
who deserves all our praise and our honor and our worship. And that the remedy for whatever the battle you're going through is praise. And that God enters your circumstance, enters your marriage. That God wants to work on your behalf. He wants to work strongly on your behalf. But would you let him? Would we just begin to allow our homes, our marriages, our relationships just to be bathed and saturated with God's presence? Some people that, some of you are go-getters and we, we see the mission, we see the to-do list, we see the tasks and we, we just go out in our day but maybe God's just saying, hey, wait a minute, stay before you go. Come in before you go out. Go in and then go out with my presence. Know that I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to leave you. Be mindful. Be aware, deeply aware of my manifested presence that's here to help you in what God has called you to do. Lord, I pray, Lord, as we just worship together right now as a congregation, Lord, that you would inhabit the praises of your people. Lord, there would be refreshing, there would be healing. Lord, for some that maybe have just lost their hope, Lord, that you would restore hope. Lord, their hearts have been broken in pieces, Lord, just shattered pieces that just in worship, Lord, they begin seeing you putting pieces together. Lord, some that are just needing your wisdom, God, that as we worship you, Lord, that your wisdom would just be manifested in our circumstance and we'd just hear your voice, that we are sheep and we hear your voice. And Lord, that we'd have the boldness and faith and courage just to obey your voice, to stay the course, to move forward in you and through you. So Lord, we just raise our hands just in humility before you. Understanding, Lord, that we are sons and daughters, that you are loving Father, that we depend on you and need you. And Lord, I pray for New Life Church. Lord, I pray for us as a church that we'd enter into a new level of worship. Lord, we'd understand it's the key to breakthroughs. It's the key to winning the wars, to overcoming the mountains, that the mountains would melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. As we begin to call on you and worship you, and Lord, that you begin to do miracles in our homes, miracles in our businesses. Lord, I just think for some businessmen and women, Lord, who've almost lost hope, the fear has become like a mountain and they've almost they've felt trapped in the circumstance. God, there would be something where there would be a holy courage and a boldness. And Lord, their eyes would begin to see what you see. Lord, that they're going through the mountain or over the mountain or the mountain, Lord, is just melting. And Lord, you're giving them strategies, Lord, to, to overcome and enter into the promised land of where you've called their businesses. Lord, as we think in our hearts, so are we. Lord, I pray for the mind, the will of Jesus in every businessman and woman here. In Jesus' name, new hope, new faith, new strategies, I pray. But Lord, that we'd be the first ones to say as we see, as we bless going in and bless going out into 2018 that we'd be the first ones to give glory to you. Lord, we'll say, Lord, you brought us through. Lord, it's not just our talent, but Lord, it's your grace, your anointing, your presence that's brought us through. And so, Lord, I pray for your blessing on everyone, blessing on every home here in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just worship you. We love you. We magnify you. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered in Jesus' name. We're going, Lord, with you, going in with you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, bless you.